We are not scheduled to go our full time today. Um, so I might actually split this uh, lesson up in two, um, just because, because I can, um, just to do it justice. All right, here we go. So we'll go ahead and take off running this morning. Um, this is a good crowd in a way. It's like we should have a picnic more often, um, but then I don't get as much time, so I don't know. It's a, it's a plus or minus uh, how we go with that. Um, all right, so we're, uh, we started the, a study in the Gospel of Matthew a few weeks ago. Uh, we've covered, uh, in, we covered one Sunday of introduction to the Gospels and then an introduction to Matthew, and we covered the first four chapters now, and we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount today, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, and what we're going to talk about is more of a, a how to interpret the sermon today, and we'll look at a few of the verses, but we won't go through all the verses in detail. And the outline of the book that we're following, uh, which is not... Um, original with me, uh, focuses on Jesus as the Messiah, the coming King. And we looked at uh, six ways that, that Matthew, in chapters 1 through 4, Matthew gives us four evidences as he presents Jesus as, six evidences, sorry, as he presents Jesus as the King <clears throat> uh, in, those, in those first four chapters. So he, we looked at those six over two weeks. And now we'll start the next section, uh, the king authenticated, which is the end of chapter 4 through the beginning of chapter 11. Um, so this is the section we'll spend the next couple weeks in, uh, Lord willing. So <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5 verses, uh, verse 1 through the end of chapter 7. And you might recall from the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew that uh, Matthew is gen generally uh, chronological through the life of, uh, through the ministry of Jesus, life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, but it's not completely chronological. So just to set the context a little bit, if we uh, look at chapter four, uh, kind of the end of the chapter, which uh, we we skimmed over last week. Uh, Matthew describes the beginning of Jesus' ministry. In chapter 4, verse uh, 12, he says he go, after the, um, the temptation, uh, he goes up to Galilee and begins his ministry up there. And his, his message, chapter 4, verse 17, is the same as John the Baptist. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I pointed that out. This is what, the reason that Jesus is baptized by John. Jesus is identifying with John's message. And then Jesus goes out to preach this message. Then he calls four of his disciples. Not all 12, but we only have recorded four of them here in Matthew. Uh, and then we get kind of a summary statement. It's beginning in chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, uh, paralytics and he healed them and great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan so this is a summary statement of Jesus's teaching this is what was happening in general not necessarily at one point in time okay because obviously he was in Galilee he hasn't gone to Judea and Jerusalem yet but yet Matthew points it out uh, he talks about how he, his ministry was preaching, teaching, and healing. Uh, and both Jews and Gentiles went out to, to see Jesus and, and be ministered by him. Uh, and remember how we pointed out how Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, but he keeps bringing the Gentiles in. 
uh, he, so he keeps bringing them into the conversation in his genealogy, uh, in the Magi, and again here uh, we see from the people from Syria. People from Syria would have been Gentiles, uh, north of Galilee. So this is a summary statement. So now on one particular occasion uh, during his ministry, early on in his ministry, Jesus sits down and he teaches. And this is, brings us to chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so in chapter 5, verse 1, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them. So he's going to uh, begin to, to preach this. Uh, we call it the sermon. That's how it's come to us over, over time. Um, his, it, whether it's a sermon or it's, a, or it's just a time of teaching or discipleship. Um, but uh, it's come to be known as Sermon on the Mount because he, he went up in the mountain. Okay, so the question that we want to ask first, we want to look at briefly this morning, is how should we interpret and apply the Sermon on the Mount uh, to us today? And there's some, there's some different ways of asking this question uh, or answering the question. One is that it's directly applicable to the church. So what Jesus says here, we apply directly to us. It was as if he spoke it uh, for the church. Uh, or the second option is it's not at all applicable to the church, and uh, we could skip over it and um, not gain anything from it. Okay, um, I don't take that view. The third is that it is indirectly applicable to the church. In other words, it's similar to uh, when pastor preached through Numbers. Numbers is not written to the church, but there are things in the book of Numbers that we as the church can learn from that and apply to our lives. And uh, that's another view of the Sermon on the Mount. There's another way of asking these questions that might help. And there's more than three views. Um, it's just kind of like three points in a poem. You have to have at least three. Uh, but... Three views on the Sermon on the Mount is one, it was written for the church age. Um, and this is often the case for, church, for uh, churches or for believers who say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that that is the church. The kingdom of heaven is the church, and therefore this message is for the church age. We should implement it during this time. Um, some would say, well, he's preaching the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it says the gospel, and he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom, uh, chapter 4, verse 23. So this message is for those who will be living during the kingdom age. It's uh, for, the, for them. And a third option is it's, uh, being pre it's applicable to those during the time before the kingdom begins. And I'm actually going to make an argument for, for the last one, that the Sermon on the Mount is not for, directed to the church, it's not directed to those in the kingdom, but it's actually directed to those who are living in the time uh, preceding the kingdom, although the church is preceding the kingdom, you could argue. Okay, so let's look a little bit uh, at this. What is the historical context for Jesus teaching. When is Jesus teaching? We brought this up before that to, to help us keep in mind uh, the interpretation of the Gospel of Matthew is to remember uh, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27. In that prophecy, it's the prophecy of the 70 weeks. The first 69 weeks are uh, fulfilled literally and historically. We can number the days and when we number the days, we find out that at the end of the 69th week, the Messiah is cut off. He dies. So, so it is, Jesus dies at the end of that 69th week. Then there's a short period of time in Daniel, a transition time, and then there's a covenant that the Antichrist makes with the people of Israel. From the time that that Antichrist is, uh, the covenant is made, it's, it's another week, okay, or seven more years. And then there's a short transition, and the kingdom begins. Okay, that's the chronology that's set out in Daniel chapter 9. The Messiah dies. There's seven years of tribulation. 
and then God establishes his kingdom on earth. So Jesus is alive still. He hasn't died. The Messiah hasn't died. We're still in the 69th week of Daniel. Uh, the tribulation is about to occur, and then the kingdom. And you re recall we, we mentioned that the, the, the disciples were always looking for the kingdom to be established on earth, even through Acts 1, after Jesus' resurrection. All right, so this is the time that Jesus is teaching this. He's teaching the Sermon on the Mount during the 69th week of Daniel. All right, so what is Jesus teaching? Well, he's teaching the law. He's primarily giving clarification on what the Old Testament teaches. And I put some cross-references here, which I don't think are in your handout completely, no, but there's room for notes if you want to jot some of those down. Um, but this is where he is teaching the right view of the law. So Matthew 5, 17 gives us the introduction um, to a, a large section of Matthew. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Jesus said, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not a Yoda, that's the smallest character in the Hebrew alphabet, nor even a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is yet future, what Jesus is teaching here. And he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus begins this statement about the law. He's coming to uh, not abolish it, but to fulfill it. And then he goes on to clarify the law. So in some of his examples, so in 521, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Uh, so, yes, thou shalt not murder. That's correct. But where does the second part come in? Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. He said, you've heard it said from old. This. Well, we know thou shalt not murder. That's clear. It's the Ten Commandments. But what about the second part? So you remember the scribes and Pharisees continued to do what they would call fencing the law. They tried to uh, make rules around the law. And one way was to guard the law. So, well, um, let's say you can't walk on the Sabbath. Well, how far can't you walk? Well, let's say it would be a sin to walk one mile. Okay, if it's a sin to walk one mile, then they would say you can't walk more than half a mile on the Sabbath. By half a mile, well, maybe you walk half a mile out and a half a mile back, and that makes one mile. Okay, so then you don't cross one mile. So th this is these are actual conversations that Jews have had for centuries, um, where they where they try to protect people from sinning against the law. But Jesus says that it's not just the outward action of taking a life that's in qu in question. Verse twenty two. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is going to be liable to, to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will, will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So the, actions of, the action of murder, Jesus says, is not, uh, it's not just the action that's a sin. It's our actual attitude towards our brother that can be sinful. And even out of anger, to be angry with your brother is the same as if you committed murder already. It's worthy of the judgment. So where does Jesus get this? Well, Deuteronomy 5.17 is one cross-reference. But I'll give you another one, and I, I don't know, just see if you noticed. Okay, so last Sunday, for those of you who were here last Sunday, pastor preached on... Numbers 35, 34 and 35. Numbers 35, I, I don't know if you picked up on this. I, I, I did, but that was 
because that's, you know, I'm strange that way. But um, you'll notice a really interesting phrase when they were talking about the laws pertaining to murder, Numbers 35, beginning in verse 22. But if he pushed him suddenly without enmity, oh wait, let me go back, not 32, let me back up, uh, let's see. Yeah, verse 20. So talking about different laws about murder. He says, if he pushed him, the murderer pushed the victim, out of hatred so that he dies. He shall be, the one who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. Do you notice that if he does it out of anger? So what is Jesus clarifying from a passage like Numbers 35? The anger came first. The anger was enough. He didn't have to strike his brother. He didn't have to throw a stone at him. He didn't have to, to beat him with something. The anger was enough. He is a murderer in his heart already. So these are all examples from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching the law. And these are the, some Old Testament cross-references uh, that pertain to him. So Jesus is teaching in the 69th week of Daniel. He's teaching the law, he's teaching clarification about the law. He's also teaching about righteous acts. Uh, so in chapter 6, so the law is primarily chapter 5. Chapter 6, he talks about righteous acts. Uh, giving to the poor, the first part. Um, how should we pray? How should we fast? Putting our treasures in heaven. And he, uh, of course, gives us the Lord's Prayer as, a, as an example in the middle here. Uh, but this is in the, the uh, area of righteous acts as they're seen, uh, under, again, under the law. The end of, uh, let me see if I'm getting ahead of myself. Oh, okay, I'm getting, I won't get ahead of myself. Okay. We'll come back to a couple of these and look at them in a little bit more detail. I'm going to keep skating over it, though. Uh, Jesus is teaching the law. He's teaching righteous acts. And remember, he started in that summary statement um, back in chapter 5, verse 17, uh, that our righteousness or the righteousness of the people he's talking to has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, or they will not be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, so this is explaining what those righteous acts are. In chapter 7, he primarily is talking about retribution. Um, judge not, they be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And uh, he talks about um, these uh, these. Really, again, they're Old Testament. I could put Old Testament references in here, but I don't have them. Um, laws of retribution that are from uh, from that are based on the Old Testament text. Uh, he even quotes he quotes from places like in verse six: "Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you." Um, so. He is again talking about laws of retribution, which are Old Testament. Um, he's teaching that the kingdom is at hand. And here you see I've got references that are in all three chapters. So in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, he says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, what Jesus is teaching about the Old Testament law, he says, if you become relaxed about the Old Testament law, uh, if you don't keep it it's in its entirety, you might still enter the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is coming in Again, the 70th week of Daniel is coming, and then the kingdom is coming. Uh, you might still enter the kingdom of heaven, but your place in the kingdom is not going to be a very high-ranking place. Okay, you're going to be at the lower rung of the level. And those who do well to keep um, 
the, the, the law uh, will be great in the kingdom of heaven. So those who keep it well and teach it well, when the kingdom comes, they will have a prominent place in the kingdom. But then he warns them that their righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. And I think that statement is uh, a little ambiguous for the Jewish hearer. Oh, wait. Uh, I can be relaxed and get into the kingdom. I can be stringent and get into the kingdom. But I have to still be greater. My righteousness has to exceed that. of the, How does that happen? I think to the Jewish mind in Jesus' day, there's a big question mark over that. And I think that's um, part of Matthew's point. Uh, I think he wants them to ask that question. How do I do that? Okay. We know the answer to that question. We, we can't. Um, they couldn't do it on their own. Something else had to be provided for them. Uh, chapter 6, verse 10, of course, the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are to pray for God's kingdom to come. Uh, it's yet again still future, but Jesus is teaching about the kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 33 is a very well-known verse, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And again, his righteous, our, our righteousness is tied to the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. And what are all those things? Well, food, clothes, um, uh, place to live, um, shelter. That's what I was looking for, shelter. Um, all of those things will be added to us. Uh, so if you're living um, in the 69th or 70th week of Daniel, Jesus is saying, what do you pursue after? Pursue the kingdom. It's going to come. You know it's going to come. You know when it's going to come. You can count the days. Once the covenant is made, you can count the days. You know exactly when the kingdom is going to be coming. Persevere. Live a righteous life and persevere to the end. The kingdom is coming. Don't worry about your food. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about your life. Seek out the kingdom. It's on its way. In chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, uh, he, he's talking about a judgment that's going to come. Of course, he's talking a lot about judgment in chapter 7. Now, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And he says that there's going to be people who, again, at that judgment, think that they should be allowed in based on the works that they have done. Uh, their own works which they have done and Jesus is not going to let them into the kingdom at that point in time so Jesus is teaching about the kingdom that is to come so Jesus is teaching during the 69th week of Daniel he's teaching primarily the law in this sermon to those who um, theoretically if the church age hadn't come in between uh, would be facing this time uh, in a short amount of time. All right, who is he teaching? Whom is Jesus teaching? Um, he's teaching his Jewish disciples. We've read uh, several of these verses already. Uh, he, it was his disciples that came to him uh, that he was teaching, going back to chapter 5, verse 1 as well. Um, So there are some plenty of verses. But Jesus is teaching his Jewish disciples these things. So summary. All right, so the Sermon on the Mount is indirectly applicable to the church. This is my conclusion, and I, I know I'm going really fast. So uh, there's probably room for questions. Um, it's indirectly applicable to the church is my, is my conclusion. Whoa, that went too fast. So how then do we apply it to the church? That's our question. If it's written for these Jewish believers who are in the 69th week of Daniel or in the future will be in the 70th week of Daniel, um, preparing them for the kingdom which is about to come. If it's written, if, if that's his audience, if that's who Jesus is addressing. 
and he's not addressing the church, then how do we, the church, apply it to us? Because I think we can. I think we should I think we can. So how do we do that? Um, I think we apply them to the church without necessarily binding the church um, to them. And we, we see this really um, perhaps the easiest uh, in chapter 6, and actually I didn't put, I didn't put this up there, but if, even if we just look at the first, um, well, no, we can look at prayer. Pray, praying in public. All right. So Jesus teaches about praying in public. The Jewish people had a habit, and Jesus actually mentions it here. The Jewish people had a habit, they still have it to this day, of praying aloud in public. Uh, if you, and I haven't been to Israel, but there is the, the, the wall that they will go and pray in front of. Um, I have been in plenty of synagogues and uh, other Jewish services where this, is, this happens. And I've mentioned this before. One of my friends, when I was in high school, he, he went through his bar mitzvah, and I went, went to his bar mitzvah, and there he's taught how to say the prayers. He's not taught what they mean. He's just taught how to say the words. But what, he do, but what he did, they had to correct him on this, and you may have seen this, is when the Jewish people pray, they, they'll rock. Now, if someone's praying and you're looking at them and they're rocking, even if you're far away and you can't hear what they're saying, you know that they're praying. Uh, it could be uh, the same with somebody kneeling, you know, with their hands folded and their head down. You know that they're praying. There's a certain posture to that. You don't have to hear them. You can see them. Uh, you know that they're praying. They're praying in public. When I was uh, working in Romania, there was a Catholic church uh, right down the street from the seminary. And at noon, they would ring the, the bells, and it was a call for prayer. And you could, they had the back of the church open, and you could go in, and they just had a few pews there with kneelers. You could go in and pray. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I mean, there's plenty wrong with the Roman Catholic Church, but there's nothing wrong with spending time in prayer uh, in the middle of the day. So, uh, so you, you can see that. There's, there's something to be seen there. What Jesus teaches about prayer is to not let it be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. In other words, that's why they're there. They, they don't care whether God can hear them. They care whether or not you can see them. Okay. So, so they're being hypocritical at that point in time. And Jesus says they've already got their reward. Their reward is not that they were heard by God. Their reward is that they were seen by men. And that's all the reward that they're going to get. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, this is, I mean, this is, this is good advice, right? We shouldn't want to pray in such a way as to bring glory to ourselves and not bring glory to God. Well, now we come to the church age, and Paul teaches us that men should be praying in the assembly aloud in front of everybody else. So, so which is it? Um, yes, men ought to be praying aloud in the assembly in front of everybody else. Now, for those of you who haven't done that, for me, um, it, it's, a, it's almost, a, I don't want to say a terrifying experience, but the, the, the constant thought of what people think about what I'm saying, because you, most people aren't looking at me, but you're, you're listening to me unless you can't hear me, like John just turns his earphones off. Um, but you, you become concerned uh, um, about what you're saying and what people are thinking about what you're saying. So you can get up here on a Sunday morning uh, and pray in front of people, and that's your goal. Your goal is just to be there, to be heard by men. Um, or you can get up there and, and try as hard as you can to pray 
and forget about people listening to you and to pray to God and actually lead people in that prayer uh, to be heard by God. And uh, obviously it can be done. Uh, it comes with that temptation, though, of, of wanting people to hear us. And I, uh, when we were in Granite, I would tell the, we had a lot of young boys who were becoming you know, young men or like Joseph's age who would say, if someday, if you want to be prepared to pray in public, then you have to be praying in private. The practice comes from your private prayer life. Um, otherwise, when you get up in front of people, it's going to be it's going to be terrible and awkward. But practice now by praying in private. And if you get to pray in public, um, you'll be prepared to do that. So, so praying is an example. Uh, and of course, Jesus tells us that the Lord's Prayer is an example. Um, Paul, of course, also gives us an example in 2 Timothy 2 of things that we should be praying about in the assembly. Uh, and uh, they're not contradictory by any means. Um, uh, but they are, of course, um, uh, we're praying to the same God in that case. Um, and verse 14 is interesting. Um, I don't know if I want to talk about verse 14 today because we're, we're kind of out of time already. Um, so I'll go. Maybe, like I said, I might split this into two weeks and we'll, we'll come back next week and touch on some of these. Um, so that's how I kind of see uh, how we apply this. There's definitely something to be learned from what Jesus teaches about praying in public. And there's definitely something that we can take and apply to our situation in the church, when, especially in times when we're required to pray in public. Um, uh, I, th I think that attitude is certainly the same. Um, oh, I guess, that's, I guess I'm done. Okay, well, according to the clock, we have like two minutes. So I can entertain all kinds of questions. Um, or if I can clarify something. Joseph. Praying in public? No, or is, sermon. Yeah, so the question is, um, how, so when we talk about theological questions, we sometimes rank them in priorities. Those things touching on the gospel are highest priority. Um, what Joseph is asking is, how far up the ladder does this, this one go? Uh, a lot of good people disagree on this, and I would not break fellowship. I would not, I mean, I wouldn't make it a matter of church membership um, by any means. I think uh, for me, it's just trying to rightly understand Matthew in the context in which he's uh, writing his gospel to, um, to the Jewish audience. To answer those two questions, 